So first of all, I'd like to very warmly welcome you to our Postgraduate Information Day 2015. This is uh, an event that we started last year for the first time, originally conceived as being something for our master's applicants to come to and find a little bit more about what the college is all about, um, what it's like to be a student here. Uh, and then we realized that because the open day, the postgraduate open day is very early, it's in December, it might be useful for prospective students to come and find out a little bit more about whether they'd like to apply to come here. So this is our second information day. Um, and we therefore have a mixture of people who've applied for master's courses or who are interested in possibly applying for PhDs or master's courses here. And before we go any further, I just want to thank very much Jim Osborne, Dr. Jim Osborne, who's put together today. And I'm thanking him at the beginning because he's just about to go out and sort out the information session that follows this. And I wanted to thank him while he was still here. So thanks very much, Jim, for all your work putting on today. Um, so the purpose is not to give you lots of facts and figures in this session because you can get details about the areas that you're interested in in the information session that follows. And this is a very informal session that follows where you can sit round tables with course organizers or administrators or students from the courses to ask particular questions that you have about PhDs or master's uh, programs. And there'll also be a chance to go on tours if you want to have a little tour around the labs. Uh, three of our PhD students will be taking short tours around labs in three of the buildings on this campus. This is only one of several campuses we have, but we thought it might be nice if you wanted to, to have a look. So that's available as well. And it will be clear in the session what's happening at which table. So feel free to, to go around and there'll be tea and coffee served as well. So the purpose of this session to start with <coughs> is for you to hear from a number of staff and students, just tiny little snapshots, so everybody's limited to five minutes maximum, um, for us to give our own personal perspective. So it won't be comprehensive, but the idea is, again, to give you an idea of what it's like to, to, to be a student here or indeed to be a, a member of academic staff here. So I'm going to start off with my snapshot, which is in the context of one of the hats I wear, which is as the academic lead for master's programs in the Faculty of Medicine. And so I'm going to give you a general overview, very briefly, of the master's landscape in the faculty. And very briefly, I'm not going to dwell on this because it's all on the website, but we have um, 23 separate master's programs, of which several have uh, streams. So altogether we have 38, nearly 40 distinct program streams within the portfolio. And nine of these courses are what I would call laboratory-based. So either they're completely immersed in research for the whole year, either by doing two six-month projects or three four-month research projects in labs, in active research labs, or they have six months of research at the end of the program preceded by six months of taught element. In addition to that, we've got courses which I've put under the category of public health, science and policy. So we have three courses run in this uh, category. Two of them are full-time, and then the health policy one is part-time. All the other courses I've mentioned are only available full-time. And then finally, nearly half of the courses are for healthcare professionals. So these may be doctors, nurses, occupational therapists, dietitians, nutritionists, etc. Um, and they also come into the category of research-based programs where a project will weave through most of the year or they will have taught uh, blocks with a shorter research project. Um, and finally we have a course for engineers, so medical robotics and image guided intervention. In addition to that we've got several short courses and indeed a summer school that's just started uh, this coming summer. So. Um, Distributed amongst all these courses, this year we have nearly 500 students in the faculty and I was reflecting for this talk on why you might want to come here. And so my starting point was why did I come here? Because I myself am actually an alumnus of, of an undergraduate degree at Imperial and I thought why did I come here for that? And indeed why did I come back as a member of academic staff 15 years ago? And I thought of three reasons, and the first one is excellence. So if you're coming to do a master's course somewhere, or indeed a PhD, 
you want to make sure that it's going to be something worthwhile. And there's no doubt that having a degree from Imperial does open doors. It's also a quality environment. And what I mean by that is that we've got great people here and there's great resources. So you will all be members of the Graduate School, for example. Um, and we have a lot of resources available to us that do make us feel, when we reflect on it, quite privileged to work and study here. The second one is community. You do feel when you're at Imperial as though you are at the, immersed in a research environment that's at the cutting edge of making things change, you know, making changes. Um, you're immersed in discovery. It's a privilege to teach here because we do have fantastic students and I think my colleagues would agree with me that we, we, we learn as much from our students indeed as we impart, it's, it often feels, because we have great discussions and we learn a lot from one another. We're also very diverse, so we have students from all over the world, we have students from a range of types of universities, we all work together, and Imperial has a sense of being a meritocracy. It doesn't matter who you are or where you've come from, we, we all discuss together and grow together. There's also a tendency, I've noticed, that people tend to stay. So you'll hear from a few of the people here that they came as undergraduates and stayed, or in my case, I came as an undergraduate and then came back as an academic staff member. So there's something about the place that makes you um, tend to stay or come back. And then finally, in the re recent Research Excellence Framework, all the universities are vying for which type of uh, grading they're going to look at as to where they came. But we came very high for impact, and that's no mistake, because that's really our USP at Imperial. And that's really what I felt when I was coming as an undergraduate. We are a place that tries to make a difference in the world. And that matters to me. I don't want to be somewhere where it, I'm purely thinking in theoretical terms. I want to try to make things better in the world. And I do think that that's something that you get um, in this environment. So I'm going to leave it there and just say that I'm looking forward to meeting uh, you later in the information session and um, indeed at the PG Connections event that we have tonight. This is a series that we have for our postgraduate students in the faculty and we'd be delighted if you'd stay on for that this evening. So thank you very much and I'm going to hand over now to... Toby! <laughs> Okay, so five minutes. Thank you very much. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Toby Andrew. I'm the course organizer for um, the MSc in Human Molecular Genetics. Um, <clears throat> and what I'm going to say, it, it's one of the, the MSc courses that uh, Jane mentioned that has a six month. Um, lab-based component. So hopefully what I say in the next few minutes will be equally applicable um, to the other lab-based MSc courses. So um, similar to Jane, I, I thought about uh, just distilling what I think is the very best uh, in terms of recommending um, um, why, uh, recommending why you would want to attend um, an MSc course at, at Imperial College. And I agree with Jane that we're very interested in making an impact upon the world, but there's probably something that's even more important than, um, or certainly precedes um, the desire of, of, of making an impact. And that is that um, you need knowledge uh, before you can apply it in a useful way. And not just facts or accumulating you know, expensive data sets, but real understanding, science-driven um, um, uh, knowledge. And these, uh, certainly the, the MSc courses we run, we pride ourselves in um, not only in like any MSc course being very intense for one year. We, we, we teach you a lot in, the, in those um, 12 months. We expect a lot of our students. We have very high expectations, so it's hard work. Um, but in addition to, to the intensive training, we actually pride ourselves in making sure that you do, uh, we try and instill a sense of critical thinking and actually engaging and uh, engaging with ideas and, 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 and thinking, thinking critically about uh, the research that we want to train you uh, to do. So our primary aim with the, the MSc courses and, and of course the, the, the PhD program is that we want to train the next generation of scientists. So uh, obviously with the, the one year, we, we, uh, we can teach you, we teach you for six months 
Uh, certainly on my course, you will have four weeks, you'll have two fortnight practicals where we teach you uh, all the kind of ABCs of, of um, basic wet lab um, research from uh, safety, keeping lab notebooks, through to um, PCR techniques, genotyping, and uh, preparing for uh, samples for, for sequencing and so on. Um, but, and we also teach you analytical methods, uh, and on my course uh, we teach you human genetics and uh, basic uh, molecular uh, genetics and genomics. Analysis is very important uh, in, in this day and age, so, so we do plenty of that as well. Um, in addition, uh, um, because we, we uh, have ex high expectations of, of our, our students, um, we make sure that on these courses you have regular interaction with, with uh, academics. So that's not just with lectures and workshops and, and all the normal teaching, but you have tutor groups, we organize journal clubs, there's uh, um, poster uh, presentation sessions and so on. So we're trying to um, train you to, to, to think like a scientist. Um, and this culminates in a six-month research project. Six months teaching goes past very quickly, uh, but you then be placed with uh, a world-leading expert very often for your, for your six-month research project that will more often than not be based either at Imperial College or a university in London or in the southeast. But again, certainly on our course, um, some of our students can go anywhere in the world because we want you, you to, we go where the best science is. So if we're collaborating with somebody on a particular project or indeed if you uh, um, have ideas about what kind of um, project you want to do, then we work with you to, to, to place you on the very best research projects. So at the end of that, you come out with a, um, a, a very prestigious MSc. Um, it's, it's internationally recognized, so if for most of you it will open doors. Uh, certainly on uh, our course, I'd say at least half our students go on to either do a PhD or um, academic research. About 30% maybe go on to uh, industry and maybe 5 to 10% uh, go into NHS research. So it's, 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 a, it's a very good stepping stone. Um, but it, be warned, I mean, all MSCs are very intensive. It's hard work, and particularly here. But it, it should be very rewarding. So I would recommend it, um, I'm considering carefully coming. Thank you. Pass on the button, isn't it? It's sort of like a sprint. Okay. Um, my name's Gary Frost. Um, I'm a dietitian by background, and I've spent most of my career working in health, and I guess that's why I'm here talking about postgraduate training and health. So just, just so I can get an impression, how many people here have a health background? How many people are looking to try and actually marry that up with one of the courses here? So there's a few people around. I'm going to flick back to Jane's slide here. So, if you look down that, most of these courses, you can relate to health. You can ask, well, why should you do that? You've got a, a background professional degree. Why should you be looking to actually supplement that? I think things have changed in the health service. They've changed a lot. One of the core requirements for health service workers now is research. Keeping up with the literature is incredibly important. Doing practice that relates to what's currently published is very important. And these courses, at the core, are aimed to give you the skills to do that. They're very different. This suite of courses down here are the ones that I'm involved with. So the MRES. You've heard about the MSCs. The MRES is a slightly different. The MRES is are out there, their purpose is to give you skills, in this case, in our case, in clinical research. So how to do work with human participants. It's how to actually get a clinical trial off the ground, for example. It's how to understand or how to synthesize very complex literature. It's how to look at data sets, big data sets, with humans. 
so such as large GP data sets, and understand what that data is telling you about day-to-day -day practice and how you actually might improve it. Just like you've heard, these are more than qualifications. People have all sorts of reasons to get involved in this, lots of personal ones. But again, these are more than just qualifications. These open doors. This suite of courses is here is relatively new, but the people who have left us have gone on to very widely different careers. So for nurses that have been on the courses, it has challenged, challenged, channeled them into a different career path. It's opened a career path in research to them. For some of the dietitians and physiotherapists that have been on the course, it's opened the actual ability to go on and do a PhD. It's actually got them promotion because in their job spec, it says if you get a research degree, it can put you through one of the health service gate gateways. For some of the physicians on the course, it's established their research career. So far more than an actual degree. And if you take it at a very basic level, what's it doing for you? Well, it's actually enhancing your day-to-day -day job. It's making you understand how things change within health, what you should be doing to actually improve things. Why am I involved with it? Well, I think um, you heard about this very thing. I like teaching. I like teaching enthusiastic people, and the people that come on this course are enthusiastic. They expect a lot. We hopefully give them a lot. The environment's very challenging. The actual facilities here are second to none. You probably on your way and work, walk past what is one of the best clinical research facilities, certainly in the southeast, if not in the UK. We have students working in the Phenome Centre, Again, a UK, if not world-leading serve, 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 serve service. So it's wonderful. It's a wonderful environment. You put in a lot, you get out a lot. You're looked after well. So that your supervision, we offer you to, well, most of the programs will offer you two people to look after you while you're here to ensure you meet the gateways. So an academic supervisor and a supervisor that's related to the course. So you don't fall through gaps. So it's, it's wonderful. I can't understand why you aren't just all signing up to it now, basically, to be honest. And you've got flexibility. Teaching's changed. Teaching's changed a huge amount. So it's not didactic teaching. So some of these courses for Imperial will be taught at distance. There's an option there. There's an option about flexibility of how you learn which again, for health service workers, is terribly important. If you're a nurse wanting to keep your career on path, it's very difficult for you to get time out. You know, you can't sacrifice weeks and keep your job. So that flexibility is there amongst these courses to help you achieve that, and also to help, hopefully, you get whatever your dream is, moving on to a PhD, getting that extra, extra bit of promotion. The other thing that's very difficult to quantify, although these are encapsulated here in the clinical research, what you have within that is a very diverse collection of people. You have people who are basic scientists, you have people who are nurses, dietitians, physiotherapists, uh, health, health service clinical scientists. So what you get is a diverse people that you mix together with for a year from very many parts of the world. And that's very difficult to quantify, but it's wonderful. The students this year have got themselves really well organized. They do journal clubs themselves. They actually also have their own social part, which I don't have anything to do with, but they actually go on and do all sorts of things within London. So, so there's a cascade of things that are very difficult to quantify that actually make it worthwhile. So, Clinical research, clinical health research, is incredibly important. It's incredibly rewarding, and I think we're the best at it, so you've got to come here and do it. Okay? Thank you. Oh, yes, sorry. That would be embarrassing, wouldn't it? Oh, that one. You don't want my card.
Okay, uh, can you hear me? Uh, well, thank you very much, all of you, for being here. My name is Lakshmi Renye. I'm a student of the Master of Molecular Medicine. And I came here to tell you what is it to be a Molecular Medicine Master student, or in general, a Master student at Imperial. And well, what can I say? Apart from being a super experience in the academic sense because you're working and you're doing a project with amazing scientists, the top scientists in the world, you're having your lectures with people who actually love teaching, <laughs> like the professor just said. And also, you're having these uh, lab particles that enhance your already, uh, if you have or not have background uh, in the lab, you have the chance to improve that. And then you have these amazing societies. There are so many societies you can join. And actually, I will <laughs> let me show you. Um, I prefer a slide. So there you can see some of the things I have done at Imperial. And well, from discussing politics with people like Lord Norton or Lord Carrington to go to a pirate boat party or winter wonderland with my friends. I have met friends that I hope will last lifelong. But what is the thing I love the most about Imperial? Because you already know how amazing it is academically, how good and how many societies we have, and you already know that you're gonna meet a lot of people from all over the world. But what I love the most about Imperial is that I have met people who is passionate about what they do, that has all, his, uh, all their effort put on science, and that you really, see that what you do matters and that you can really make a change and that you can actually contribute with something. And I came here to grow not just as a professional but as a person to develop a still unknown pathway, a journey that I really don't know where it's going to take me. But the only thing I have very clear is that in union and working in team with all other scientists and as an institution we are able to change the world and we are able to get a better future for future generations. So I'm really grateful that I have the opportunity of being here in an institution that actually integrates this amazing background in science, but also is human. You can see integration, you see multiculturality, but many places are multicultural. What I see here is integration, diversity, but in communion real community and that is what I love the most about Imperial and thank you very much and well you can see the pictures some of my friends from molecular medicine and sitting there in the first row and yes I'm the Santa Claus <laughs> thank you very much for coming and Hi, I'm Lucky Bulawal. I'm the Faculty of Medicine Lead for Doctoral Degrees. So I have oversight over the PhDs that are, that are carried out within the, uh, within the faculty. So I just wanted to remind you that actually uh, Imperial College as a medical school is actually younger than the people sitting in this room. Uh, we're only just over 15 years old as, in the entity as you see it today. Yet in that 15 years, we are recognized as being a world-ranked uh, medical school and well ranked for our research within the Faculty of Medicine. Uh, on the QS world ranking, we're ranked 10th out of a total of 3,000 institutions. We're third, according to the Times Higher Education Supplement in Europe, and we're fourth for, for, for clinical medicine. And within the, uh, the, the recent um, the HFC REF, we came out fourth overall as a college, but the, the medical school being so young, we became fourth within the country as well. And um, we're particularly noted for our work in public health and the health services, where we were ranked second in the country. And what this really shows you there's an, is an enormous amount of talent within the Faculty of Medicine. Research talent, talent for delivering medicine, people who are enthusiastic about the work they do, both in terms of research and in terms of the clinical practice that they offer. So we as a whole have a total of 927 
uh, postgraduate research students within the department. So most faculty, so most of those are PhD students. And our breakdown is that we have um, about 20% who are overseas students. So that shows you that we are actually a diverse population. Uh, uh, and about 40% of our students are what we call part-time home EU. And that's an unusually high population. And the reason for that, and it's important to understand this, is that those are actually clinicians doing PhDs within the Faculty of Medicine. Virtually 100% of that, 39%, are clinical research fellows undertaking PhD studies within the Faculty of Medicine, which means that if you come to do a PhD here, not only will you be working with people from all over the, all over the world, but you'll be working alongside clinicians who are also being trained as scientists. And that makes for a very important, very diverse uh, research environment. Um, our students as a whole are spread over the various campuses of the medical school. Today we're at the Hammersmith campus which has over 40% of our PhD students. So don't be surprised if you bump into one or two of them today. Um, our students are actually very satisfied. According to national surveys as well as local surveys, we get a very good high uh, satisfaction response. And if you go to, um, to Google and just Google the words doctoral proposition and Imperial College, you'll actually come across something that we as an institution state to the rest of the world, which very few institutions do which is what we want to offer you if you come to do a PhD with us. And it breaks down very simply. We will provide you with a world-class research program, and that goes with our world ranking. We will provide you with innovative and effective professional development. So we have a fantastic graduate school uh, development program, which ensures that if you come and do a PhD at Imperial, you will be in a position to leave not only with your PhD, but actually with uh, the ability to open opportunities for yourself no matter what career path you go into. We will deliver outstanding network opportunities. So we will provide you with the networks that will enable you to go on and to do this, to develop your career, but develop other interests that you may have while you're here. And we will offer you long, uh, lifelong membership to the imperial community. So that includes our alumni community. And our alumni are actually very extensive, a great network to hook into to again help you develop your careers, both if you're here in the UK or you decide to go abroad or if you've come from abroad to study here at Imperial. So that's, that's fantastic. Now the other thing that I want you to, to note is that all of this research, this postgraduate research, is embedded in something that's very, very important. We run one of the country's only um, six academic health sciences centers. So these are partnerships between uh, institutions which are higher education institutions, so universities, and, um, and hospitals. And we are one of six in the country, there used to be 15, and three of those are in London. Now what that means is that we are able to provide uh, PhD students and uh, researchers within our faculty the opportunity to do their research embedded in a clinical setting. So we're able to translate a lot of our research into impact, which Jane has mentioned into the benefits for, for patients. So this goes to high in clinical trials, as well as access to clinical material and resources that you would otherwise be unable to get. So that's what's really, one of the things that's really helped us uh, get this world recognition that we're a leading research uh, institution for, for medical research in the world. So what I want to do now is really to pass the baton on now to, um, to um, um, eventually to two students that have been on programs that we run within the faculty, one who's currently on a program, one who's moved on. But before we do that, uh, Duncan Rogers, one, uh, one of my colleagues from, uh, from NHLI, will talk about postgraduate research. Uh, Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Okay, guys, so I'm Duncan Rogers, and can I just, can you put your hands up Who's thinking about doing a PhD here at Imperial College? So quite a few of you. So you've obviously, you know, you've come to the right place. So don't think about it. I mean, just sort of do it. Um, <laughs> now, you've heard about the master's courses, and they're a very good um, sort of feeding ground from which we can get uh, postgraduate researchers to do, to do PhDs. We also get PhD students coming in from outside this environment as well, and so that's very good. But this is a new thing that's come in, and so my two recent uh, PhD students have actually come from the top one there, so the Biomedical Research MRES, 
where there are various streams. And so these two ladies, you've got Gurpri on the left and you've got Tash on the right hand side. Tash's hair actually isn't like that at all, she's wearing a wig. And they're clearly very happy. This is clearly Christmas time. It was Christmas last year, 2014. They were both very, very happy. Firstly, because um, Gurpri had actually got her PhD late last year. And secondly, Tash was particularly happy because she managed to submit her PhD just before Christmas so she could have a hell of a time. <laughs> and the idea is that you will be enabled to get this PhD. And what you will come out with will look like this you will have a lovely PhD which will be bound in the Imperial College purple binding and you can look at that and you can, stick, you can give one to mum and dad you know, and they can sort of show it to their friends. And the path that gets you to this thesis is very well structured to a certain extent. Um, there are various stages that we will take you through to, to enable you to get this PhD. We have you come with a plan after about four weeks and that plan is assessed by various people and they will give you top tips on how to improve it and tinker with it maybe. And then after a few months, maybe just coming up to a, the year, year stage, you'll have a so-called early stage review. And you'll present your work, both written and oral, to a couple of assessors who will give you feedback on how you're getting on with this, uh, with, with this project. And then later on, when you're coming up to about the sort of two and a half year mark, something like that, you'll have a late stage review, where at that stage you're really starting to get your data together, planning the thesis, and these, these people will give you good feedback on where to go with this. Not only that, not only will you have supervisors, you may have one and usually two supervisors these days, um, you'll have a mentor, and that mentor will not be related to the, to, to the project, won't be mates of your supervisors, they will be at, apart from that and you can go to that person and discuss any problems you may be having or anything that you want to talk about. Now during the process of doing a PhD there's all sorts of enjoyable things that you can do other than doing the PhD or having Christmas parties. We at Imperial College and certainly at the National Heart and Lung Institute where I'm based, but I speak across the board, we will encourage you to go to meetings to present your work. So these guys have both been to within, within, within the UK, for example, the British Association for Lung Research. But they both went abroad. They both went to the European Respiratory Society meeting in Vienna and also Barcelona, where they had a hell of a time, I understand it. Um, they're also going to Amsterdam, where I presume more of a hell of a time will be had. Um, <laughs> Tash is determined that she wants to work in the States. So she's doing a postdoc with me at the moment, but she wants to go to the state, States, and she's meeting some people. She's going to the American Thoracic Society meeting in Denver in a few months, where she's going to be in discussion about doing her, her future postdoc. Gurpri, I can't tell you what she does, because she is now doing a postdoc in the so-called bio-incubator here, which is where secret research goes on, money-making research, sort of biotech company. So if Gurpreet told me what she was doing, she would have to kill me. And then if I told you, I would have to kill all you guys. <laughs> Finally, and this is very important and very different from the days which are many, many eons ago when I did a PhD, is that you can do other things. So not only will you go to meetings, not only will you do your PhD, but you can become involved in outreach projects, for example. So Tash and Gurpreet were very involved with a so-called pop-up shop in, 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 in the Hammersmith Mall where we had a cardiovascular and respiratory week where members of the public could come along and they made models of working hearts and all sorts of things. They've also been actively involved in the Bring Your Child to Work Day, another outreach program that we run at the NHLI and this year we had all these kids came in and we had to find out who killed the macrophage. The macrophage is an inflammatory cell and it turned out to be the dreadful cigarette smoke particles and that was a fantastic day that we had. They also been very involved with teaching, demonstrating, so there's more to doing a PhD at Imperial than just being at the bench, just doing lab work. You can do all sorts of things which will broaden the horizon as, as the previous speaker, uh, this lady with the MSC said, broaden your horizons beyond just the PhD, all sorts of other skills and attributes. So thank you very much. Who's next?
everyone, I'm Harriet, um, and I'm hopefully going to give you a perspective of a PhD student. So um, I started out with a biochemistry BSc at Imperial, and uh, I knew that I wanted to do research, but it wasn't really until I, I took part in iGEM, which is basically a synthetic biology competition for undergraduates. But it really, it was the first time that I got to be creative about problem solving in the lab. Um, I got to work in an interdisciplinary team. And it was also my first experience of doing a little bit of outreach and public engagement. So I, iGEM was really important to me in deciding to take research on. Um, I then applied for the MRC studentship uh, because I, I knew I wanted to do something a little bit more medically relevant. And uh, I knew I was interested in translational research too. Um, at the time of applying for that studentship, I don't think I realized what an incredible opportunity it was uh, and how much support I would get. But yeah, definitely a good, good decision in hindsight. Um, so I chose to do the biomedical research uh, MRES, mainly because I, I learn best when I'm doing things practical, practically, and uh, I don't learn very well from lectures. I get a little bit fidgety and uh, I have a very short attention span. Um, so I, I, do, I did two six-month projects for my, my master's, and uh, I also used that year to talk to lots of people all around uh, Imperial about where I might be able to do my actual PhD project. And I heard about an, an interdisciplinary collaboration happening where the researchers were aiming to apply nanoparticles to diagnose TB. And I thought that sounded really, really interesting. So I got in touch with the PIs, uh, met them individually, and it all kind of kicked off from there. So um, I'm split between uh, the Department of Medicine at St. Mary's Hospital um, with Professor Mike Levine and the Department of Materials at South Kensington. So I can spend half my day with clinicians, bioinformaticians, geneticists, and research nurses at St. Mary's, and then the other half of my day with material scientists, chemists, uh, and physicists at South Kensington. And actually, this, all these people feed into my research and make it a really rich experience. So I feel very lucky to have that um, at my disposal. Um, so when I'm not in the lab, uh, or keeping up with the literature, or subjecting people to death by PowerPoint, as I'm doing probably right now, um, I've been able to mold my PhD experience to what I'm interested in. Um, and Imperial really supports you to do this. So just a few highlights would be, um, I got to spend a couple of months working in Singapore with our collaborators. And as well as getting some really useful, feed, uh, useful data for my, for my PhD project, um, it was really interesting to experience a different research culture. Um, so I'd, I'd recommend trying to work in other groups if you can. Um, I've also really enjoyed teaching undergraduates. Um, so I, I teach on the Global Health BSc and problem-based learning for first and second year medics. Um, uh, there's loads of training offered by the EDU, and if you're considering a, a career in academia, that might be something to think about. Um, I also really enjoy uh, science communication, and I, I think researchers have a, have a responsibility to engage the public about their work, especially if they're funding it, which in my, my case they are. Um, so yeah, I, I've been able to work as an outreach postgraduate ambassador for Imperial. So that's more about kind of widening participation, talking in local schools about my work, and also a STEM net ambassador. Um, and that's been really fun. For example, that picture in the middle there is, is the Big Bang Fair. And I got to judge science projects at that for the last couple of years. It's really good fun. Amazing projects done by very young scientists. Um, and just lastly, um, I, I put a team together for the Biotech Yes competition, which is a national competition which aims to educate PhD students about commercialization and uh, about bringing uh, a biotech product to market. So we had to create a business plan. And something that really helped us on our way to success was the mini MBA course offered by the graduate school. And actually, the graduate school offers tons of courses. This is just one that really helped us uh, in this situation. Um, I think that's it. I'm going to be around later if you have any questions. Um, I think I'll hand over to our next speaker. Thank you.
Hi, so my name's Nikki, and um, I'm currently a postdoc at Imperial. Um, so I thought that I'd just give you a brief outline of my career so far and how I've ended up at this point. Um, so as you can see from this, I did the MSc in Molecular Medicine at the Hammond Smith campus in 2007, and I haven't left Imperial since. So I stayed for my PhD, and um, I've been a postdoc here for the past two years. So I thought I'd just give you a bit of an insight into why I chose Imperial in the first place, and also why I haven't left yet. Um, so um, I came out of my um, undergraduate degree, and I knew I wanted to do research, but I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do. So I chose to do a master's here because you got to be lectured by like, world experts in loads of different fields. And then you got to do a really long project, which I thought was a good idea to get a lot of lab experience before choosing what to do for your PhD. Um, so I really enjoyed my master's. I made a lot of friends who are still friends now. And um, yeah, I learned a lot of science alongside. Um, so then I did my PhD here and um, was really lucky in that the funding that I had has allowed me to do things like um, collaborate with other institutions and also to go to international conferences. So I went to about three conferences during my PhD and they were really good fun. You get to meet lots of other people that share your science interests and also go to new exciting places. Um, so when my PhD was coming to an end, I knew I definitely wanted to stay in science. and. Um, I wasn't too sure what to do next. I had ideas of things I wanted to do, but obviously you're supposed to go down the route of doing a postdoc. Um, I was really fortunate in that it was the MRC centenary year, and they had funded my PhD. So I was eligible to apply for some funding. Um, and it had to be a very collaborative um, project. And this is where I think working at Imperial came in really handy. So if you go to prospective collaborators and say that you're based at Imperial, they've obviously heard of the institution they tend to have a lot of respect for the institution and there's an expectation that you probably know what you're doing. So uh, we got the money and I was able to do a really collaborative project working between a lab here but also um, a lab in Oxford. And that money kind of lasted a couple of years and gave me time to work out what it is that I'm interested in and what I wanted to do further. Um, and also kind of gave me the confidence to apply for a slightly more scary um, funding um, and I was lucky enough to be awarded one of these welcome fellowships about uh, a year ago um, and what this is is basically an opportunity to carry out your own independent research um, in a very collaborative manner in multiple different institutions um, again I'm based at Imperial for part of that but not the whole thing but I think that being here and the support that I've had here um, is kind of what's given me the ability to go and get um, this funding so I think that the, the most important thing that I've got out of Imperial is really the support from senior staff members at every single point. So during my master's, my course organizer was fantastic and very encouraging and told me what PhD studentships to apply for. And then throughout my PhD, I've been given a lot of help and advice in how to secure more funding and how to progress my career how I want to. So I think that I owe Imperial a lot for that. There you go. Hi everyone, welcome again. I'm Mike. I'm the overarching student representative for the Faculty of Medicine. Um, and as much as the academics and the students here try to um, sell to you how Imperial is excellent for, for medical research, I'm here to give you a different reason, and it's all to do with the student's experience and student representation. So I'm actually like many of us here, an imperial oldie. So I did my bachelor's here in neuroscience where I met Jane. And uh, in that time, I've, I've really gotten to know how much uh, the staff here values um, student input in education. Um, they're really, they're extremely passionate about what I call inclusive education. And that means that students are involved in decision making when those decisions concern academic welfare. So uh, the college uh, and the graduate school in the college runs uh, multiple projects every year, all to do with enhancing student satisfaction and the student experience. And we recognize that one size 
education doesn't fit all. That's not what, we're, not what we're about. We're about making it personal to you. We have over 60 elected student representatives here in the faculty every single year, and they sit on various course departmental and faculty level committees to really engage, um, to, to, to be engaged with um, designing curricula and improving um, the experience um, to make sure that the education that you, that you receive from us is one that you want and one that you need. Um, as an academic and welfare officer for the Graduate Students Union, which is the, um, the organization uh, in Imperial College Union that takes care of all postgraduate students, um, I'm involved in the social aspects of things, but also the, um, the representation, the academic representation um, side of things as well. So I know firsthand that uh, multiple systems, support systems out there, um, uh, they're there for you to improve um, your experience here, whether it's run by the college or by the um, student elected union bodies. And I can go on for ages about, you know, all the stuff that I am involved in with Jane, with the graduate school, with the union, with the college, um, to show that we care about student voice, but I'll let you be the judge of that. So just please come up to us and, and have a conversation in the information session after this. And before I go, I have to say, um, please stay for the PG Connections events because um, it, it's an event that's, that's led by our, our very fantastic Jane Safello over here, and it really showcases how much we care about professional development just as much as academic development. And uh, Jenny, who has been the leading figure in education over here since before my time, five years ago, um, will tell you about how to add an international dimension to your future success. So thank you very much, and please come and say hi. OK, thank you, Mike. And, and before we carry on, I'd just like to say thank you to all our speakers. Um, if we could all show our appreciation.